We have big problems, big, big problems. I want you to listen to this along with me. Uh, steady rain in the morning, becoming a soaking rain in the evening. Chance of rain, 90%. Rainfall, half an inch. High of 52 degrees. That's what awaits us in Corvallis, Oregon this weekend. Now, I'm not scared of rain. I've been rained on before. I will be rained on again. But nevertheless, we're walking into a situation where we have undefeated Washington on the road and featured for the second time on the Once Upon a Saturday tour. And we're going to talk about that tonight because upsets could be in the offing in a lot of places. But if Washington lost this weekend, at least in the eyes of Vegas, it would not even be an upset. We're high atop a dry and warm comparatively speaking, downtown Nashville, Tennessee, Thursday, November 16th, the year of our Lord, 2023. You may have felt the tremors around the sport this afternoon, and that was about the time that Jim Harbaugh in Michigan decided, yeah, we've had enough of this. We're going to agree to the suspension. Yes, if you're just getting off work, getting home, living your life earlier today, that happened. I will have reaction. I do believe that Volcanic Saturday is still out there somewhere and could very well be on our doorstep. Could week 12 be the weekend where all of those theories and all of those projections go up in smoke because a bunch of people who aren't supposed to lose all of a sudden lose? The Texas A&M fight continues. Now, you may think, fight? That's a weird way to say coaching search, Josh. No, that's continuing as well. But as you know, I've had both shields up, one shield in each hand, fighting off the casuals that I never knew existed, at least the casual argument that I never knew existed about this whole A&M search. So I'm going to give you some thoughts on the search and I'm going to give you some really ridiculous screenshots of some tweets tonight. I got several added best bets. They're watching us in Cocoa Beach, Florida, Medford, Oregon, Corpus Christi, Texas, and Las Vegas, Nevada. Now, I've got a really weird travel schedule coming up. So we're going to fly to Portland tomorrow and we'll drive down to Corvallis. But here's the problem. I will get out there way too late to do Friday Night Lines. So we got one of two options. We can either scrap Friday Night Lines, which as you know is not an option, or we can just do special morning edition of Friday Night Lines tomorrow. I have chosen the latter. And so breaking news here, not even Colin or Jesse knew this until a minute ago. Tomorrow morning, 10 Eastern, 9 Central, 7 Pacific, Instagram Live, at Lake Kick Josh. I'm going to do Friday Night Lines, but it's going to be the morning version. So those of you who have never tuned in, this is a good time for you to find out what Friday Night Lines is all about and I'm going to have three added best bets on this show tonight. But tomorrow morning, special one morning only edition of Friday Night Lines is going down. And also, I'd advise you to go ahead and follow on Instagram now because I have it on pretty good authority that Kublik bailed on the show because he's in the air flying somewhere right now. But I got it on fairly good authority. He and I may do something on Instagram Live a little bit later tonight. You know how lively the comment section can get when you got me and Cube there live? Out of company purview, by the way. Just say whatever you want to within reason. At Lake Kick Josh. I'll see you there. All right, let's talk about this. So the Big Ten and Michigan have come to some sort of handshake emoji agreement where Michigan and Jim Harbaugh have accepted the Big Ten's three-game suspension punishment investigation over, at least as far as the Big Ten is concerned. The investigation into sign stealing, et cetera, et cetera, is over. There is no hearing on Friday, so unfortunately for some out there, you're going to have to talk about a football game, absent Jim Harbaugh, of course, but you're going to have to talk about Michigan-Maryland. Did you guys know they play this weekend, by the way? No? No? I'm seeing a lot of head nods. No. Yeah, they do play this weekend. Talk about that game a little bit later, but in the meantime, I happen to think that the sort of fence riding technique we took on this show about this was right all along, because as you can clearly see, this was not a scandal to end all scandals in the Big Ten. This was not, as some people framed it, one of the biggest scandals in college football history. No, it was never that. But it also wasn't nothing. It wasn't something that was just meant to smear Michigan's name. It wasn't a nothing burger, which I hate when it's even used in politics. I especially hate it when it's used in college football. There was something there. Uh, that's why they agreed to this. So, so neither side that was shouting at each other, believe it or not, was 100% in the right. Neither side had all the facts on their side. Uh, there was plenty enough. I, I can pretty well rest sure. There's pretty, there plenty enough to concern Michigan to the point that, what, 24 hours before that hearing where you potentially get a lot of people that have to be on the record and you get into discovery and all this sort of thing, 
right before that happens, they say, okay, we'll, um, we'll agree to it. Look, I saw the movie The Rock. Like, I know exactly what just happened. If you've never seen The Rock, not The Wrestler, the movie, really good movie. Really good movie. A lot, of, a lot of very, very timeless quotes in that movie. But essentially what we had was we had Ed Harris, who led several tours in Desert Storm back in the 90s, black ops, and lost a lot of men. But since it was a black ops, the U.S. government disavowed all knowledge. They didn't compensate the families for the deaths. And he stewed on it for a few years and decided, I'm done stewing on this. And so he did what anybody would do. He hired some mercenaries. He went and loaded himself up with some VX gas rockets. He took hostage a tourist group on Alcatraz Island, and he pointed three rockets at downtown San Francisco, called the president and said, if you don't compensate the families, I'm going to kill half San Francisco. Great movie plot. Uh, And then Nicolas Cage and Sean Connery saved the day. Spoiler alert. But in the meantime, it turns out Ed Harris was just talking big. Ed Harris was actually a human with a pretty big heart who had no intention of blowing up half of San Francisco. It just so happened that at the 11th hour, we found out because they called his bluff. And he even looks at his men and says, hey, it's over. I'm not a madman. They called our bluff. That's kind of how I picture the room at Michigan. We're going to talk big, which, by the way, would have been my strategy as well. We hope they back down. But if they don't and they got enough on us at the 11th hour, we're going to agree to this. Uh, it's kind of a no one wins, but also no one totally loses situation. Tony Petiti kind of wins, the Big Ten commissioner. So, so this was a classic Ed Harris rock situation. The storm, as I've said two times this week, and I will now say a third time, is clearing for Michigan. Now you may say to yourself, or you may say to me in the comment section, no, this is just the beginning. Josh, think about what the NCAA is going to do to them. The NCAA is not going to do anything to them aside from find them a whole lot down the road, and that will be after years of legal ping-ponging back and forth. That's a legal term there, legal ping-ponging. I don't, if I'm a Michigan fan, I don't stay up late tonight or any night worried about what the NCAA is going to do down the road. I don't even know that they'll exist by the time punitive uh, measures are meant to be handed down to me. So I got my conference off my back. My coach is going to miss some games. I don't think my team is necessarily going to suffer all that much from losing that coach. And actually, on the other side of the coin, maybe we'll benefit from it. We're a player-led team. We're a veteran-laden team. There's probably no team in America more equipped to operate without their leader on Saturday than Michigan without Jim Harbaugh. So I look at it, and it's not exactly the way I thought it was going to conclude, But it largely concluded probably the best way it could conclude. And I know a lot of people, again, who who care more about the drama around the sport than the sport itself are kind of upset. Hey, I'm just excited that we get to talk about college football games again. You know, it is November, after all. These are not the spring meetings. We do have competitive games ready to be played 48 hours from now. And that's why we got to move on because we got a jam-packed show. You know, I said we're headed up to Oregon State. We're headed up to Corvallis tomorrow. And we will be on the sideline Saturday for Washington versus Oregon State. We've never been there before. And who knows what the future holds. I know there's a lot of legal maneuvering out there right now as it relates to what the future of the Pac-12 is. And I'm pulling for you guys as Pac-12 Pate. I have a very emotionally vested interest in what happens to hashtag our conference. But in the meantime, hey, we're, we're full strength right now. So I'm going to be out there and I'll, I'll poncho in hand. I got to I got to watch out man cuz as a lot of you ladies know that that rain can do can wreak havoc on your hair can just wreak havoc on your hair so that's my one major concern don't care about much else that's my one major concern the once upon a saturday tour commemorating this trip is available now patestatematerial.com that t-shirt is there and Colin if you could take 1A for just a second this sweet laptop sticker is also there and I got to be honest with you I had the guys who run the store send me pretty much every product we have, and I did not know that it arrived like a month ago. So so this Pate State material, this Pate State Freight's laptop sticker, it's just been sitting in my mailbox for a month, and I didn't even know it, so shame on me. Anyway, back to business. Do you think this is the Saturday that all the major upsets happen? We, we at this point have not had that Saturday. We have not had that shake-up Saturday or, or, you know, tectonic Saturday. I call it volcanic Saturday. 
And I'm just a believer that you can never go a full college football season without having that one memorable Saturday everyone looks back on and says, that's the Saturday that blew up the sport that given year. No one really expects it this weekend. I expected it last weekend and we didn't really get it. Now everyone's sort of looking towards rivalry Saturday or maybe conference championship Saturday. And I'm like, let's start with Michigan, Maryland. That's a noon kickoff on Saturday, and no one's talking about it because everyone's talking about Harbaugh. And Michigan's been obviously trending the right direction. Maryland has been trending the wrong direction. The line at FanDuel is 19 and a half right now. Michigan favored by 19 and a half. And I ask this, and I'm going to paper pop on the question. Is Michigan immune to reality? Here's what reality is. This is the second leg of a back-to-back road stretch. It is sandwiched between your two biggest games of the year. You've got all the the off-the-field stuff going on with your head coach. This game last year was very close. Maryland played them close. 34-27 was the final. Are you immune to all that? Because most teams would be impacted by that. The championship caliber teams, the ones that have got their you-know-what together in November, they sometimes can be immune, and it's Teflon. That stuff just bounces off of them. Let's see. I got a sneaking suspicion Michigan can take care of business here, maybe even emphatically, but let's see. I'm going to put a four on this, on the upset alert meter. What's my concern level? Not very high, four, but at the same time, it wouldn't be the biggest shock in the world. You know, a quarterback who can push the ball down the field and and baby Tua, it wouldn't shock me. It wouldn't be the biggest shock in the world if I turned over there late third quarter. Oh, we still got a ball game. Let's see. The next one. It's very interesting, uh, because if I were to ask you guys before you have checked the FanDuel odds, what do you think about Louisville-Miami? The you are what your record says you are crowd probably thinks Louisville's favored by 10 points, and they're not. Louisville is a short, short one-and-a-half point favorite at Miami. This is also a noon kickoff. Notice a trend here. You don't have to wait very long Saturday. The next one I'm going to talk about is also a noon kickoff. You don't have to wait very long Saturday to start potentially seeing some upsets brewing. I would call this a fortitude Saturday for Miami. Like Miami, the world's going to tell you you don't have anything to play for. You've always got pride to play for. Uh, You guys have shot your own selves in the foot, partly with poor decision-making in the Georgia Tech game, partly with turnovers in two other big games, or else you'd be in the thick of this ACC championship race. Well, as it turns out, you still got a shot to make a lot of noise. Tyler Van Dyke got benched. Emory Williams went down, you're, you're reinserted. So make the most of it. You got a chance against one of the favorites now, or the favorite, co-favorite, to go to the ACC championship game to show what fortitude you have. Uh, fortitude is courage in pain or adversity. A lot of teams would lay down in this spot. Miami going to lay down? Or are you going to play one of your best games of the year? I think they'll have success running the ball, even as Louisville has been really good against the run. I just don't think they faced... Uh, enough high caliber running attacks and I think you'll you'll see a higher caliber rushing attack with Miami this Saturday I'm going to put an eight on this one I mean the line's very short it's one and a half so I'm going to put an eight on it Uh, that's the upset alert meter for that one what about Penn State without even knowing who they're playing you assume this could be a really flat spot for them no it's fair to assume that I guess they're playing Rutgers another noon kickoff on Saturday Uh, What's in the tank? After you lost to Michigan the way you did, what's in the tank? We all know what the goal was. The goal was to beat at least one of Ohio State and Michigan. Well, that's down the drain now. And I don't know. After they played Ohio State, the offense did eventually bounce back a couple of weeks later against Maryland. But what did we see last week? Uh, We saw complete ineptitude offensively. Now, here's what else we saw, which gives me a little bit of courage for Penn State this week, and that is they fired Yursich. They fired the offensive coordinator. Uh, J. Juan Sider, friend of this program, is going to have the play calling duties this Saturday. So do they avoid a Shiano special? Greg Shiano is with, they would love nothing more than to get this one because no one cares about the circumstances. If you're a 20 and a half point favorite and Shiano and Rutgers take you down, no one cares that, that the air had been let out of your tires the week before. It is a huge Not a career-defining upset, but a big upset for him. And that's when it would go from, let's just make some changes, to a conversation that sounds a little bit different for Franklin. I don't mean hot seat. I just mean uh, 10-2 and losses to the two big boys. Okay, 
Nine and three with a loss to Rutgers thrown in there just because you couldn't get back up off the deck. That's a different conversation. I'm going to put a five on this one and keep an eye on it. Next up, North Carolina is at Clemson. Oh, no, no, no. Jesse, is this number right? This is another, this is another big lie special. Oh, no. What am I talking about? Well, if you're new around here, thank you for joining us, by the way. If you're new, uh, people lie about this sport all the time. I don't like it, and I don't encourage it, but it happens, and I have to live with it. Check that. No, I don't. I have to call it out. And one of the biggest lies ever told in college football sounds like this. <clears throat> you are what your record says you are. Well, I have got a 6-4 and four Clemson favored by nearly a touchdown against 8-2 and two North Carolina Saturday. But Josh, that's home field advantage. They're playing at Clemson. Let's just be ultra aggressive and say Vegas gives Clemson four points for home field. They probably don't. But let's just be ultra aggressive to remove all argument. Uh, that still leaves the Tigers as a two to three point favorite on a neutral field. Does Vegas not know the records of these teams? You are not always what your record says you are in this sport. Having said that, this is an upset alert game. It's just the team that you think should be on upset alert. It's not the one on upset alert because the six and four team is the one that's favored by nearly a touchdown. There are some crazy, crazy six or seven paragraph deep tiebreaker scenarios that could theoretically enter the equation if North Carolina pulls this off and if Louisville loses to Miami. Uh, the conference probably still sees Louisville play for a conference title, but there's this small shot for North Carolina. Having said that, the model loves Clemson this week, and uh, it's actually one of our best bets. It's on the Ramen Noodle Express. We gave that out the other night. So I'm putting this at a five, a very modest five. Mac Brown, it was announced today, will be back for 2024, so that's not really that much of a talking point. Uh, there's no controversy there, at least in the immediacy. I think Clemson's going to take care of business Saturday. Still worth watching. It's a 3.30 kickoff. And lastly... Uh, this game Saturday night, eight o'clock. It is Texas, Iowa State. Texas at FanDuel right now is favored by seven and a half. I am putting a 10 on this. Why? Because I love Iowa State. That's why. I don't have to pretend otherwise. And I actually think that uh, there could be some merit to this. So it's not a pretend 10. You see what I did there. And I actually think when you tune into this one Saturday night, I think it's a Fox game, eight o'clock. Uh, it's the first game without Jonathan Brooks for Texas. I have concern if they don't get off to a fast start. Now, as we've seen, even if they do get off to a fast start, it could be trouble later down the road. Somehow that is a thing with Texas this year. But also, I happen to believe that you only have a finite amount of these, these instances where you just sort of skate by, and TCU last year notwithstanding, I happen to believe in that. So they go to Iowa State this week, do the Texas Longhorns. Again, we, we are a big believer. The second stretch in those back-to-back -back road game stretches, the second leg, that's the one that bites you more times than not. It's certainly a Super Bowl situation for Iowa State. Iowa State is still in the Big 12 championship picture, too. I'm putting a 10 on this one. I'm very concerned for Texas. Very concerned. And so I saw them in person go on the road and beat Alabama. How crazy would it be if they pulled that off and yet still had two losses in the regular season uh, come Big 12 championship week. Well, everybody's got them penciled in, and I, I think pencil is probably the appropriate tool to be writing in right now. Don't write in ink yet, kids. A lot can still happen. We're actually going to talk about that later in the show. All right, let's continue moving, and let's move right over to this beautiful monitor over my right shoulder, Academy Sports and Outdoors. I have got not one, not two, but three bullet points in front of me because we got three new stores opening this week. So if you don't have one in your backyard, I may be about to change that for you. First up for our friends down in West Palm Beach, Florida, Port St. Lucie, Florida, 1525 Northwest St. Lucie West Boulevard. I, it sounds like, sounds like a lot of directions, but that is the address for this place. Grand opening going down this weekend. Hutto, Texas, that's in the Austin market. Town West Commons, 250 Alliance. I'm just giving you some addresses here. And thirdly, down in Harlingen, Texas, that's the Brownsville market. Expressway 83 and Dixieland Road. Any of you make your way to any of these locations and provide photographic or video evidence publicly 
that you showed up and supported our brand, I am entering you to win a chalice of supremacy. We're giving away five of them this weekend. We just gave away five last weekend. Those are shipping out uh, today or tomorrow, by the way. So I appreciate you guys for that. Academy, I had a nice little conversation with our Academy folks today. Uh, they, are, they are big believers in the chalice. And while they don't sell them themselves yet, they do sell pretty much everything else you need. Tailgating equipment, camping equipment, hunting equipment, basketball, baseball, football, you get it. Also, Big League Chew in the checkout lines. Probably one of my favorite traditions for our audience is when they go to Academy, they buy a pouch of Big League Chew in the checkout line. Wholesome, wholesome stuff. Let's continue. Let me take a sip from the chalice. It is appropriate that we have maroon-ish colored liquid in the chalice. Because um, the, the stuff, for lack of a more appropriate word, at Texas A&M is still happening. So as you know, Colin, here's your good end point. As you know, Jimbo Fisher's been fired. There's a coaching search happening at Texas A&M. Now, I do want to talk about the kind of mechanisms involved in the search first. I am more resolute today even than I was the other day in saying there are names in play for this job that you don't even know are available because it's that good a job. How good a job it is, don't worry, I'll, I'll loop around to that nonsense in a second. For those who understand this industry and this sport, they know this is a tier one job. Not two, not three, tier one job. Everything they need as head coaching candidates, they have at Texas A&M. And so it is attracting a lot of attention, obviously. I was listening to longtime friend of the program, Billy Lucci, and the folks over at Texax talk the other day. And what he said was the same thing that I had heard about when they fired Jimbo. See, sometimes when you fire a head coach, it's conventional wisdom that you wouldn't have fired that guy if you didn't already have his replacement lined up. I heard that's not what Texas A&M did. Uh, Lucci, who basically runs that place, also echoed that sentiment. That's not what they did. Now, they may have a sheet they can pull out. Ross Bjork may have that sheet you know, that every AD talks about in their top drawer that they could pull out at any given moment. I'm sure he has that. I'm sure he didn't make the decision to fire Jimbo and say, well, now what are we going to do? No, it wasn't quite that foggy, but I can also promise you they didn't have a name in Sharpie already written down and agreed to in principle before they walked down the hallway and said, Jimbo, this is it. You're out. What they do have is supreme confidence that the value of their job is kind of along the lines of what I'm talking about. And the early returns are that's being validated by the interest from all four corners of the country that they're getting. I say that geographically very intentionally. There are a lot of names interested in this job. Now, I have been asked on a bunch of radio hits I've done in the state of Texas and elsewhere this week, what kind of person is a fit at a and When I was driving back from the airport uh, the other day, I was talking to Kublik, and we were talking about that. We were talking about what fit even means. And I'm, I'm pretty much in agreement with him that it's a very, very overused and misunderstood term in coaching searches. And I'll take you back just two years ago. A guy by the name of Brian Kelly got hired at LSU. And people, some people, said he's not a fit there. He's not a fit. Why? I asked. And they just kind of rambled incoherently and they said things about his accent and he's, he's never lived in the South and just stuff that has very little to do with football. And I countered with the blueprint and the formula that wins in college football. And I said, hey, the critical factors that win at Notre Dame are the critical factors that win at Clemson, are the critical factors that win at Oklahoma, are the critical factors that win at LSU. There are some non-negotiables. There may be some different ornaments and trappings here and there on the Notre Dame tree versus the LSU tree, but by and large, the same stuff wins that is always won everywhere across the country with comparable resources. 
And then Brian Kelly went and won the SEC West, and everyone shut up about culture and fit. And that's exactly what would happen no matter who A&M goes and gets. The moment he comes in there, he could talk with the thickest New England accent in, in the history of the state of Texas. If the guy wins, he's a good fit. Conversely, he could walk in with a belt buckle viewable from the space station and straw sticking out of his mouth with a cowboy hat on. And if he loses, he's not a good fit. Like fit is about doing what it takes to win in sports. College football is no different. And so when we start looking at a list of candidates, that's what I care about. Do I think the guy can win there? I don't really, frankly, care about all the other stuff on the periphery. And a third thing that I'm picking up on a lot as I peruse a lot of message boards and listen to a lot of fans talk, because I'm always fascinated by what the fan base thinks during a coaching search, is, what's the best way to put this? Meemaw didn't have a really good quote for this. She wasn't really into coaching searches. It's important to spend what's needed at a time like this. It is not imperative to just spend what you have. And the best way I can equate this is, I was at the Michigan-Penn State game last Saturday. And Michigan famously at this point ran the ball like 30 plus times in a row to end the game. Now I guarantee you on that offensive play sheet that was laminated that those coaches have, there were a number of pass plays that they worked on a lot and they repped and practiced Tuesday during installs that they never ran. And the reason they never ran those plays is because they realized we've got a vice grip on this game right now. And we don't need to. Just because we practice them, just because we have them, doesn't mean we have to run them. Coaching searches are the same way. Just because you have deep pockets, just because there are some flashy candidates out there that would steal the mainstream headlines and win the press conference, it doesn't necessarily mean that's the right guy for the job. And number two, just because you can pay someone $11.5 million a year and reset the pay scale in college football doesn't mean you have to. I know you guys have mixed emotions on a guy like Trailer at at, uh, UTSA. I'm not even inserting him as my favorite or anything. I'm just saying as a matter of principle, let's just say he's the best guy for the job. Let's say Mike Elko is the best guy for the job. Those aren't the biggest headline grabbers in the history of this sport on the day they're hired. But if they're the right candidate, they're the right candidate. And if you don't have to break the bank to get them, that's just an added bonus. But sometimes if you know you got money, like if, if I know I got money, it doesn't matter if this steakhouse down here or off an exit in Hamilton, Georgia, really has the best steak in the West Central Georgia region. If I know I got a four and a half star establishment down the road in Columbus or up the road in Atlanta and I can afford it. Sometimes people are dumb enough to just go there and pay the money because they think they have to since they have it. You don't have to. You, you can go to Hunter's Pub. You can go to Hunter's Pub and you get you a nice ribeye. You get you a nice filet mignon, as we would call it in Harris County, for under $50. It is a wild, wild time in this coaching search, though. So I want to revert you back to a theme that's existed on this show since the moment that Jimbo got fired. And it's a little game we play that only has losers. And it's called... How good a job is Texas A&M? And you may think this is worn out. And you may think, well, you already talked about this. You're right. Yes, yes, you're right. I have. Yes, it's worn out. But I have discovered um, this, this kind of, it's funny. There are people who call A&M fans a cult. And it's crazy because the cultish-like nature of Texas A&M fandom pales in comparison to the cult of people who exist on the internet that claim A&M is not a tier one job. It's like college football flat earth. I never knew they existed. And all of a sudden they make their argument like a flat earther would. And at first you laugh because you think they're joking with you, but they keep their face straight. And then they just stare at you and you, you go like this. You go, (laughs) Oh, are you serious? And they look at you and say, "Mm mm-hmm. And then you ask them to present their evidence and it just twists your mind in a pretzel and they never smile the whole time. And they're just getting more and more serious. So Colin, could you do me a favor? Could you show tweet number one? I've just compiled some examples. Uh, In classical fashion, the word your is going to be misspelled 90% of the time when these people try and slander you. If you're listening on podcast, I had a guy come at me because I committed the sin 
of broad strokes comparing Georgia pre-Kirby to A&M. And all I was trying to say was once upon a time, there were people who said Georgia can't win a national championship, even though they have good resources. They just, there's something about the program. So it's not the best job in America. It's not a tier one job. Georgia was always a tier one job waiting for the right candidate. It got the right candidate. That dude named Kirby Smart walked in, demanded the resources they always had. They finally came off the hip pocket, and they've won multiple titles. Uh, This dude comes at me and says, you're comparing apples to oranges, Y-O-U-R. You're you're comparing apples to oranges. Georgia last won a national championship. It wasn't before World War II, though. They had won the SEC multiple times in the last 20 years. A&M can't make it to Atlanta. All you, this is a money quote, people. Listen to this. All you look at is money and resources, but there are other factors as well. You're casual. Again, Y-O-U-R. I don't know what about my casual he's he's referencing, but um, listen to that sentence. All you look at is money and resources, but there are other factors as well. Like what? I never get an answer, by the way. I always ask, what in addition to money and resources makes a job tier one for the right candidate? Like, do you think Nick Saban looked at Alabama, saw that they had money and resources, and said, "Mm, there's some other things I need? No, he came in, and if there was a rogue booster that needed to be taken care of, he disassociated him from the program. You know, if there were facility upgrades that needed to happen, he did that. If there were people administratively that didn't understand how the games played, he looked them in the eye and said, it's either you or me. Okay, the right candidate does that. That's the whole point. You don't have to do the apples to apples comparison with Georgia A&M. I feel like what I'm saying is common sense. That's why I get a little worked up. Colin, please go to the next tweet. So the next tweet involves a guy coming at me and saying, you're dealing with SEC fans, so it's not a surprise, but it doesn't change the fact that your A&M take is wrong. So I asked the guy, what is my A&M take? How is it wrong? And what is the right take? Guess who didn't respond? The dude who made the allegation. And then I dug a little ways into the replies to said tweet, and I did find something that's interesting. And that's the third tweet, Colin, if you'll throw this up, because this is an argument that I used to hear about A&M, and I think the expiration date has long passed on this argument. But at least there was a thoughtful response here. And this person said, I think A&M is a good job, but I would not call it elite because it's going to be in Texas's shadow whenever Texas is good. They were able to recruit effectively when UT was down, but I think as UT keeps showing consistency, A&M is going to have trouble recruiting in state. Okay, on the surface, that's wrong. Just on the surface, even if you did have to live in the shadow of Texas, there are too many elite kids in the state of Texas to say that, okay? Secondly, No one's taken 100% of the kids they want in Texas, including University of Texas, and that's if Sark wins multiple titles. It's just not realistic. That's not the way it works. Number three, and let me me zoom out a little bit here. Let me tell you something. A&M does not take a backseat to Texas anymore. That's Big 12 talk. Okay, That's Southwest Conference garbage. This is the SEC they're about to be in. Texas does not have any bigger seat in the SEC than A&M does. That is a bygone mentality, and, and folks need to shake it. And I know, I know what BAS is. I know what battered Aggie syndrome is. Trust me, I'm familiar with it. I know the history of that program. I know why it exists. It doesn't have to exist. That's a rearview thing. That's not a windshield thing. You come to this conference, which you guys already have, and then you... You don't welcome Texas in, but you watch them walk in. They sit in a seat the same size as yours. The circle includes, what, at that point, 15 other member institutions. The only edge Texas has on you is one you let them get, the one they get competitively, the one they get through out coaching you and out recruiting you. It won't be because 27 different mechanisms exist in the construction and infrastructure of the conference they're in that give them a leg up. That is not the way this is going to work moving forward. If A&M's in Texas' shadow, it's going to be because A&M hasn't done things on their end to make sure they're not. But there is no limiting factor in the SEC that will artificially prop up Texas over Texas A&M. So I don't believe in that anymore. Uh, I would suggest you guys adopt that mentality as well. Clayton, North Carolina is tuned in. 
Uh, Modena, Italy. I hear it's nice this time of year. They're tuned in. Waverly Hall, Georgia's tuned in. We had to beat those boys several times to go to the city championship back in the day. Go Mudcats. Next up, a lot of hot seats out there, guys. A lot of seats are warming up. A lot of coaching searches going on, but we may have more coaching searches in the immediate future. What's happening with Chip Kelly at UCLA, you might ask? Well, I told you the other night, BruinReportOnline.com reporting via multiple sources that Kelly is likely out after the USC game. Now, that's not finalized. It strongly looks like that's going to be the case. If he loses uh, this next game, they play USC this Saturday, he will have a 33-34 and 34 record at UCLA. My feeling on this, as I listen to some of the dialogue out there, is that there may be a warped sense of what UCLA football is and could be. And I think folks are making an NIL mistake here. Folks are looking at NIL and they're saying Chip Kelly has not invigorated the donor class to contribute in the way of NIL enough. And I'm not necessarily pushing back on that part. I think there is a very, very warped sense of what tapping into your NIL potential is. So I think there's an idea that people have, because NIL is still new, that if you fire Chip Kelly, and, and let's say you brought in Lane Kiffin or Jonathan Smith or, or Jed Fish, whoever you want to go after, you brought your ideal candidate in, they agree to the job, and, and they all of a sudden get more NIL infusion. The misnomer is that that elevates you above the pack to a certain extent. It, it elevates you 20%, 30%, 40% above the pack. You're not elevating above the pack. The pack also is getting NIL infusion. You're about to go play in the Big Ten. The pac 12s done. You're going to play in the Big Ten. They play the NIL game already. You're playing NIL just to catch up to them. Now, you may say, well, Josh, isn't that what you want to do? Yes, it is. What I'm asking is, who do you think you are as UCLA? I don't ask that sarcastically. I ask it very literally. Who do you think you are? Do you think that you are 10 wins per year? Do you think that's the caliber program you are? I've got bad news for you if that's what you think. That is not what you are. That's not what you will be because you are not using NIL to separate and go above the pack. You're using NIL just to keep up. And so what I'm saying is that infusion of NIL money, once you get to this new home of yours, will be used just to maintain your current status. Your current status, what would you say, Jesse? Do they average about seven wins a year or something like that? I mean, that's their current status out there. Could be eight, could be six. My point is, and I really wonder, who do you think you are? Who does UCLA football think it is? Next up, Billy Napier at Florida. The other day, I didn't say anything wrong. I said what I believe to be true and still believe to be true, and that is his fate is attached to next year and, and this upcoming recruiting cycle. Um. Some people took that to mean I was putting Napier on the hot seat. I'm not doing that. You just heard the wrong part of the clip. So, uh, A, we should be more careful with how we clip videos, I guess. That's on us. B, I'm not saying that. I think he's safe. I don't think Billy Napier is going anywhere. And I would encourage you guys, go to 247sports.com. Uh, there was a nice collective effort today to put together the latest that our staff has heard in regards to Billy Napier and a number of other guys. And... One of the welcome portions of that piece that I read was the thinking around Gainesville is Billy Napier will be pushed or push himself to relinquish play calling duties, hire a play calling offensive coordinator, and also do away with having two offensive line coaches and actually hire a special teams coordinator. That alone would be a welcome couple of changes for Florida football. I, look, like I said, I, don't, I think he's got at least one year left. And I think it would be very, very foolish to suggest otherwise or to actually do otherwise. They are 5-5 five and five right now. They've got to pull an upset in one of these last two weeks to make a bowl game. I think they'll be competitive in both games. They've got Missouri this week. Uh, I got more on that game later, actually. And they got Florida State at home at the end of the year. They sold that game out. I, I don't think this is a dead and buried team as of yet. I don't believe that. And I think Napier's safe for at least one more year. I do not think Dana Holgerson is safe at Houston. I reached out to some folks on this today. I think he's coaching for his job the next two weeks. They are four and six right now. 
They got Oklahoma State and then at Central Florida to end the year. Their recruiting class is currently 101st in the country. They're right next to Eastern Michigan. Houston's in the Big 12 now. They are a power five team. You, you can never suck that bad recruiting in Houston. You just can't. You, you, it's inexcusable. And so there's a lot of thinking. I think he's got about a $15 million buyout. There is some thinking, including this past offseason, by Dana Holgerson himself that he's got too big a buyout. Uh, not when you got the kind of billionaires they do in Houston. You don't have too big a buyout. And uh, one in particular, I think you guys know who I'm talking about down there. So I do not think the buyout will be a sticking point. That's been echoed to me in the past couple of hours. I think he's coaching for his job. I took that to mean they need to make a bowl or he's gone. That's, that's how it loosely translated in my mind. So let's watch that closely because that, if it came open, would be a pretty underrated and desirable job. Houston, stop thinking about them as a G5. That is a power five. That's a big 12 program now. Dave Aranda at Baylor, three and seven. My, my best intel today is he needs to avoid disaster over the final two games, and those two games are at TCU in West Virginia. I don't necessarily think he has to win them. Just don't, don't have things totally and utterly implode. And if you can parlay that with his agreement to make big changes coaching staff-wise, even though they're three and seven, I think my best feel right now is Dave Aranda can buy himself another season. I don't think that's final. I don't think he's totally safe. Nothing like that. This stuff can change at the drop of a hat. But as we head into the second to last week of the season, right now, kind of 60, 40, 65, 35, I would lean Aranda maintaining his job. I'll tell you a name that keeps getting brought up to me, and I agree with it, and that's Barry Odom. Not hot seat. Like Barry Odom's out at UNLV right now. Just tearing it up, man. Uh, this is a guy who has SEC head coaching experience, got coordinator experience, been around a long time, went out to UNLV. All they're doing right now is playing at a level that has them on track to maybe even host the Mountain West Championship game. UNLV is not supposed to be playing for the Mountain West Championship. Okay, uh, the paper, you know, that this game's played on in spring and summer said UNLV kind of a, a little bit of an afterthought this year. No, Odom went out there. Just inverted them overnight, doing a heck of a job, very highly respected. I would keep my eye on him for a number of these programs, including, in case you didn't pick up what I was putting down, some jobs that haven't opened yet. Uh, Barry Odom is, is a name I think probably administrators and football people are higher on than just general fans because all you probably remember is, well, he was fired as a head coach at Missouri, and then... Last year, the defense at Arkansas wasn't all that great, and that's, that's kind of what you remember, and I'm just telling you, there's a lot more to it than that. So I'm keeping an eye on Barry Odom, and you know my boy John Summerall down at Troy, I'm keeping a close eye on as well. Just, just some names that we have hitched our wagon to here at Pate State. We don't have an opening, of course, but if we did, those are two calls I would make. We got some good Twitter questions here. Let's, let's dial some of these up. I, am, I myself am fascinated at this first one. So with all this playoff talk, Ryder from Birmingham, Alabama hit me up. He said, if Bama beats Georgia in the SEC championship game, could they actually be left out of the playoff? Now, we're taking some liberties here. Everybody is this time of year. People are taking liberties that Bama is just going to waltz into Jordan-Hare Stadium and beat Auburn no problem. Maybe they do, maybe they don't. Like, my point is, it's not, a, it's not just a slam dunk that Bama is a one-loss team when they get to Atlanta. But anyway, I know that's not fun to talk about. Everyone thinks all the chalk's going to hold the conference championship Saturday. So I'll meet you halfway. I'll play that game with you. Let me make this short and sweet. If Alabama does beat Georgia and they're a 12-1 and SEC champion, yes, there's a way that the SEC is left out of the playoff. It's as simple as this, guys. If Washington stayed undefeated, if Florida stayed, un stayed undefeated, Ohio State or Michigan, one of them's undefeated, and Texas won the Big 12 with one loss, Bama's not going to the playoff. That's as simple as that. I'd have Bama power rated over one, two, three of those four teams, but I would sit here definitively and tell you on Selection Sunday, you can't put Alabama in that playoff. You can't. 
You can't put him in over Texas. I don't care who Vegas would favor. I don't care who the JP poll would favor. If those are comparable teams and one of them went into Tuscaloosa and beat the other, you, you can't do that. It's about results on the field. You can't do that. But as I just expended a lot of breath saying that, I don't think that's going to be the situation because I'm looking on a piece of paper here at how many twists and turns this season has left. And I don't think nearly all of that chalk is going to hold. I'm telling you, if Bama wins out, I think they'll be in the playoff because I think if, if that team in Crimson there takes care of their business, Florida State still has to go to Florida and still has to play probably Louisville. Texas has Iowa State on the road this week, Texas Tech on short rest at home, and then a Big 12 championship game. Washington is a point spread underdog this Saturday at Oregon State. Then they've got Washington State, then maybe a Pac-12 championship game. Oregon's on the road against Arizona State before they play Oregon State on short rest. And then they got the Pac-12 championship game. I don't know if you guys have watched this sport a lot, but this is not the way it plays out. This is not a simulation. This is not paper. These teams are going to have to strap up and actually play these games. These favorites are not skating through all of this. And so I'm a believer the SEC is not going to get left out unless the SEC finds a way to force its own self out. And what that would look like is, you know, if, if some of that chalk holds and Bama goes 12-1 and one and wins the SEC, yeah, they could be left out. Georgia, you know, they play at Tennessee this Saturday. And while I pick Georgia to win the game, if Georgia were to lose that game and then go beat Alabama, well, what's a 12-1 and one Georgia going to do? You got a bunch of folks on the committee saying two-time defending this and that, like that's supposed to actually mean anything. Georgia may be left out, but that's if all that chalk holds. I don't think it'll hold. I think a 12, and here's where I get interested. Okay, all that I think we get. Where it would just be, be really, really uncomfortable is if, let's say, you had the Big Ten team in, whoever it is. Let's say Florida State takes care of business. You got them in. And uh, let's, let's even say Texas is in. And then you got Oregon that wins the Pac-12. I'm a big believer at the moment that uh, whether I like it or not, come Selection Sunday, there would be strong to overwhelming sentiment in that room to put one loss Alabama or one loss Georgia in over Oregon. And I especially think there would be sentiment to put in one loss Alabama over Oregon. And honestly, until I see the final resume sitting in front of me, I can't even tell you whether I like that or not. So uh, let me stop short of that. I also wonder aloud, and I, I don't know this, this is just me purely throwing it out for speculation. I wonder what Pac-12 affiliation means. I know what SEC affiliation means. What does Pac-12 affiliation mean in the last year of the Pac-12? Like in the future, you don't have to worry about this if you're Oregon or Washington, but in the meantime, you do. Does it matter? It shouldn't, but does it matter in that committee room? I think it may. Uh, if, if it came down to blind resume, and look, Bama's resume may just be good enough to be in over Oregon, period, but if it were, you know, 52-48 either way, I really wonder if that's what tilts the seesaw. I don't think the SEC is going to get left out. I think they're going to find a way in. But to answer your question, yes, there is a way. It's just, it's a very, very narrow uh, needle that you'll have to really finely thread. And I don't think this sport's good enough to do it. Next up, this is a tough question because the season's not complete, but we're going to go for it anyway. Kyler in Frisco, Texas asked, who are your most disappointing teams so far this year? I, I assume you guys have answers for me. I am supremely disappointed in USC. They're seven and four right now. Their season's almost over. They got one more game left because somehow USC worked a buy-in for Thanksgiving week. And we thought once upon a time, if they make the conference championship game, they're going to have a bye before the Pac-12 championship game, which would have been all kinds of salacious. But they're not. They're going to be sitting at home. At least they get to go home for Thanksgiving. They are 7-4. and four. They were never close defensively this year. Uh, they went and portaled some kids in, but it, they didn't portal a new philosophy in. So supremely disappointed in USC. You know what? I'm, I'm a little disappointed in LSU. And LSU's been a good team. How, how about this? This sounds hypocritical, I know. Because the JP poll has LSU as a top 10 team right now. 
But that's a power rating. The fact is they're a three-loss team, and they, I hate saying this this way because you know I value every game, but in a way they have wasted Jaden Daniels this year, and I think that coaching staff knows it. They have potentially the Heisman Trophy winner at quarterback. If I tell you at any point, LSU football is going to have a Heisman Trophy caliber quarterback, you think national championship. You certainly think SEC championship because you can just never fathom that defense is going to be what does LSU in. There's too much defensive line and DB talent in that state and around the Southeast and East Texas where they recruit. And yet here we are. We're watching them give up point totals like they have uh, against Ole Miss. 49 points was not good enough that day. It's crazy. Like they, they go into Tuscaloosa. They play Alabama really hard. It's not enough. And they played Florida State early in the year, challenged themselves. I got no problem with that. But they have, to a certain extent, wasted Jaden Daniels this year. And it's a shame. They're not a bad team. I think they're a really good team, not a great team. Uh, because I, I told you guys in August, I don't think their defensive staff is good enough. And that was, that was feedback given to me by the people who do this sort of thing for a living. And I, I think it was validated. And I think Brian Kelly's got some decisions to make the moment the season's over. I'm going to go to another team that still has a really good record. I'm disappointed in Penn State. Penn State's 8-2. and two. Penn State will be favored the rest of the way. They, quote-unquote, should finish the season 10-2. and two. Uh, That's a really good number. It sounds crazy to be disappointed in a double-digit win season, but I think we all get it. I think James Franklin gets it. Their, their expectation this year, their standard this year, was not let's just win the games we're favored in. They, they needed to clip either Ohio State or Michigan. I know that's a tall task. They felt they were built for it. They were wrong. And they've already made changes. The offensive coordinator's out. Uh, too little, too late. I'm not suggesting they should have fired him earlier in the year, but you get what I mean. It's As much as I say LSU may have wasted Jaden Daniels, look at the defense that to a certain extent has been wasted here because as it turns out, you will not have accomplished anything more this year than you have in years prior. And it's a shame because that's a very, very dominant unit they have up there. It's a high standard. I know that. I don't look at very many teams going 10-2 and two saying, you disappointed me this year. But that's how high the standard was at Penn State this year. And you know, if I was a fan, I wouldn't want it any other way. I want a high standard. I want 10-2 and two to be disappointing. <laughs> that's like that Clemson thing that Dabo's dealing with right now. That's how you know you've won a whole lot when they're disappointed at 10-2. and two. Now, it's a fine line you got to walk, but that's why you're paid a lot of money. To, to be able to walk that line a little more comfortably. Speaking of Clemson, they're 6-4. and four. How can I not be disappointed in that? They got North Carolina and South Carolina left. They'll be favored in both games. So, so maybe we're looking at 8-4. and four, But 8-4. and four. I mean, imagine. That's jarring. If you say that in the preseason, they're favored to win the ACC right there, you know, neck and neck with Florida State. Florida State's favored to go undefeated at this point. Clemson sit there 6-4, and four, and here was the disappointing part. It was over before October, and it rhymes, and yet it's not fun. They lost to Duke by three touchdowns to start the season, and then Florida State came in there and went to overtime with them, played a, a classic game, one of the best games of the year, but they lose that thing, and that's it. Two conference losses in September, and they were just out so early and since then, you know, they came out of the bye week. They lost back-to-back -back games to Miami and North Carolina State. It just, it just didn't click this year. Not a bad team. It's just that's what they are. They're a decent to good team this year. And that's, that's a little jarring. Knowing what that orange and white tiger paws come to represent, a little jarring. So it's a little disappointing. And I'll stay in that state, South Carolina. Pretty disappointing to me this year, too. Four and six. Uh, Kentucky and Clemson are the games they have left. They got to win both of them to be bowl eligible. There were just too many holes across the entire team this year. I don't zoom in on any one thing with South Carolina, which is kind of the problem. It makes it a little bit more difficult to address. Uh, at the same time, though, I, I have been uh, pretty steadfast in my belief that Shane Beamer generally has the program moving in the right direction. I just don't believe progress is always linear, and there is a large amount of variance at a place like South Carolina where, number one, you play a tough schedule every year, and number two, because you are not at this point a top 10 recruiter yet, you, you don't afford yourself the ability 
to play your B minus game and win very often. You just don't. You cannot do that. And that's why they're four and six right now. And with Spencer Rattler, road versus home, that's been an issue a couple of years now. So I don't think it's, it's something that can't get fixed, but it is disappointing. It's been a, a down year for football period in the state of South Carolina. But we all know two games left for most of these teams, and wild stuff always happens this time of year. November is, is a very long month in college football. We're proud to be partnering with FanDuel, and FanDuel's proud to offer you the opportunity to financially benefit off of any of these games you think you have a read on. Now, you know I worked out a little deal for you guys where you wager $5 on any money line bet. Go, go bet a team favored by 30 for all I care. You bet $5 on that thing and it wins, you get 150 back. That's a nice little, it's a nice little start. It's a nice little takeoff point for you. Be very responsible with this. Uh, don't, don't dig yourself in any hole. Do not dip into the Christmas fund. And even at the expense of the FanDuel folks slapping me on the wrist here, be very, very careful with this. And if you got questions, just hold off before you do it. But if you understand what this is and you understand the entertainment-based aspect and, and being responsible with money management, go ahead and jump in. It's, fun. it's a lot more fun than going and paying $15 for a movie ticket and popcorn. At least that's my opinion. And so have a, have a different way to enjoy your Saturdays. You can look in the description right now, by the way, for the rules on this free deal. And you can see everything you need to know right below the YouTube show right now, the live show in the description. So if you need what I just said repeated, go check that out. Speaking of which, if you're new or if you're, if you're showing up late, let me remind you before I get to the Ramen Noodle Express brought to you by FanDuel, let me remind you, I'm flying to Portland tomorrow. I'm going to get out there way too late to do Friday Night Lines. So we are doing a special Friday morning edition of Friday Night Lines tomorrow. Now, if you can't tune in, that's okay. I'll leave it up all day, so it'll be there if you need to check it out later. I can't promise the lines will still be available. But follow me, at Lake Kick Josh on Instagram. We will go live at, what did I say, 10 Eastern, 9 Central in the morning. Not tomorrow night, in the morning. And inevitably, people are going to ask me what time it starts tomorrow night. I'm not responding to those DMs. All right, Colin, let's go. Friday Night Lines is tomorrow, but we've got best bets to give out tonight. How about Miami of Ohio? Last night, the touchdown that got turned into a touchback, we benefited from it. Ramen Noodle Express Magic. So we're already 1-0 on the week. Let's go ahead and check mark that one. Uh, we've got Troy minus 14, Middle Tennessee minus 7, Iowa minus 3. I know the kids out. No, we're not coming off Iowa. Clemson minus 6.5. And we were on Miami of Ohio minus eight and a half. That one already hit. Okay, I'm adding three games tonight. We're taking Texas Tech minus two and a half. We are taking Southern Miss. Go Eags. Beat anybody. Well, they're playing Mississippi State. We're taking them plus 14 and a half. I think it could be a competitive game Saturday. Just keep an eye on it. That's all I'm saying. Keep an eye on it. And Florida. I think Florida is going to be very competitive with Missouri. So we're taking Florida plus... A, do you understand... The words that are coming out of my mouth, to quote Chris Tucker in Rush Hour 2, Florida getting 11 and a half against Missouri. Well, we're taking them because we think that's too many. Florida, Southern Miss, Texas Tech, Miami, Ohio, already in the bank. Clemson, Iowa, Middle Tennessee State and Troy, and I've got several more games that we're going to add tomorrow morning on, I guess, Friday morning lines. So 10 Eastern, 9 Central, Instagram Live, at Lake Kick Josh. Make sure you're there. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a little impromptu chat with Kublik over there tonight. So, so a lot of Instagram live content coming your way. I will be paying special close attention to that live chat on IG Live tonight. So, so be clean, but be aggressive in there. For Director Colin, for Producer Jesse, I'm Josh Pate. Take care. Have a great start to your weekend, and God bless.